Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Warrington Hudlin, a good friend. He's a motion picture, television, and online media producer. He's made some wonderful films, House Party, Boomerang, Cosmic Slip, Unstoppable, Black at Yale, and many others. He's the founding president of the Black Filmmaker Foundation. He participated in INET's 2016 conference in, on race in Detroit. And uh, I don't know, I, every time I run into Warrington, whether it's at a movie screening or in my kitchen, it just things start to fly and I start to learn. So Warrington, thanks for joining me and, and sharing with our audience here today. I'm delighted to be invited and I uh, can't wait to chop it up. <laughs> so here here we go. We are in a, you know, there, there's an old musician named Cat Stevens, and he sings, baby, baby, it's a wild world. Mm -hmm. And right now, it feels to me like everything is being unmasked. The covers come off the ball, all kinds of things, all kinds of uprising, all kinds of anxiety and, and chaos when a system breaks down. But it's not a system we want to go back to. So how are you seeing what's unfolding with relation to the pandemic, with relation to the social reaction to the death of George Floyd and others that preceded him? And where, what's the light at the end of the tunnel look like? And how are you and I going to help us get to that light? Well, I'm, I'm sad to say that uh, my point of view is that the system is not breaking down. The system is doing what it's meant to be, what to, when it's meant to do. And the status of people of, of color from the beginning, from 16, 19, forward, is to be subordinate and exploited. And it's almost like a person who's walking down the street and you, and you, you look in the mirror and, and you say, is that me? Did I, did I, did, do I look like that? And America has been able to deceive itself about what it does and how it treats people. And what's happened recently is that, that the reveal is there. It's always been going on. So, uh, yeah. What's the famous quote Will Smith says, it's not more racism, simply more recordings, more, more cameras. And America mm -hmm. is very uncomfortable with what it, looks, what it sees in the mirror. That's one part of America. Because yeah. the, the, bigger, the bigger frame for me is that the Civil War never ended. It simply took a pause. And the Confederates mm -hmm. are back in the White House now. And between uh, uh, Attorney General Barr and Donald Trump and, 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 and Mitch McConnell, these are all Confederates. And they're trying to uh, bring back that kind of um, status for everybody who's not white. And, and, and fortunately, that today, there's enough people who don't agree with that. So the, the kind of consensus of, of racial subordination and discrimination and disenfranchisement that America has been practicing for decades. Now, when people see it in the mirror, they say, oh, no, 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 that can't be us. So everybody's upset because they actually see what's been, what's been going on consistently. Yeah. Well, my friend at uh, Berkeley's uh, Othering and Belonging Institute, John Powell, talks about this notion mm -hmm. of othering as though if they're different than me, I can, I can categorize it, and I can say, in in, a, in almost a subconscious way, they're not even human. Yeah, oh, that's true, absolutely. They're not worth the. You know, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Well, if that's true, how come we don't treat them well, all like humans? But but, but and, however, at this, I mean, we we we, we there's constant reference to the Declaration of Independence. But in the Constitution, you know, it is codified three fifths of a man. So at the same time, and the people who wrote the man who who wrote and signed that, many of them were slave owners. So that's right. I, I think that, right. that that we I can't get seduced by the promises of of of, of uh, the the founding declarations of freedom and equality because they really did not intend to include anybody who wasn't white. That's right. And, and that, so I don't, you know, I, I, I don't. So people say, "Oh, it's, it's America has failed." Yes, it's failed. You know, it wasn't intended to work. So we're walking around 
either uh, surprised or shocked. I mean, I, I think if you're surprised or shocked, you haven't been paying attention. You haven't been paying attention for hundreds of years. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, it's the original sin of the United States, yes. and it's not, and it's not behind us. It's the it's ongoing, upon us. the ongoing sin. Yeah, but what's what's going on? Mm-hmm. What's ongoing? I'm sorry, I sound like Marvin Gaye. What's going on? Yeah, uh, things sound like this. What, <laughs> the the, the uh, what's ongoing mm-hmm. is being also fueled by young people coming up and seeing no ladder in the rungs of opportunity. In other words, there's a whole spectrum mm-hmm. of false promises yeah. that are supposed to inspire you to want to be American. Mm-hmm. And yet the bluff is being called. Precisely. And the outcome of this pandemic and mm-hmm. who's dying and who's forced into working in dangerous circumstances is a testament to that that unfairness, that inequality, that inhumanity. And 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 what makes that awareness greater than than before is for example, let's talk that there's some stats. Right now, if a person is 15 years old, then then that's black, Latino, and Asians are the majority of Americans under the age 15. Next year, they've been majority under age 16, and so on and so on. So if you're a young person, Growing up in America today, you have access and encounters and sharing the space emotionally, physically, etc., with people who from multicultural backgrounds. So that kind of the, the, the ignorance of racism is difficult to, to survive in that sunlight. When we were off in the Bantu stands, you know, segregated across the tracks, you could hold those ridiculous uh, racial viewpoints. But when you when you when you when the person, your classmate or your, your office mate or whoever is different, then the humanity cannot be denied. And I think yeah. that's part of the reason why things have changed so much now is that people know that that was a human being. They yeah. couldn't make the, the emotional, psychological separation that they have in the past. Yeah. I made a podcast recently with a gentleman you probably uh, met in, in our Detroit conference, Henry Ponder who was in his 90s, and he underscored this a great deal. He talked mm-hmm. about living in Oklahoma during mm-hmm. the time of the Depression. And yeah. he said it wasn't even that depressing because you didn't have a vision of anything that was that much different than what you were doing. Sure. But now you can turn on CNN or seeing what are Ellen DeGeneres or whatever in her mansion mm-hmm. and, and, the, and the differences, the class differences, the differences in quality of access to health care, nutrition, any form of safety are the are how do you say the contrast that is marked is now in plain sight. Exactly, that's so true. But at the same time, you mentioned from Oklahoma. I mean, that's where the the, the Tulsa uprising riot was. Yep. I mean, that's the story of of of, of black ambition, self reliance, un- enterprise that was so successful that it it, it disturbs white interests and white sensibilities, and they literally. Tore that town, to burn down that town. So, yep. so, so that kind of the the relationships, the historical relationship between the black community and white community is so fraught that it can be triggered, but but not by doing anything, but by even success. I mean, Tulsa was a great success story. Everything they, you people say they want black Americans to do today, that was accomplished in 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 in, in that period of time. So it's a very emotionally and psychologically complicated relationship that can lead to um, to gunfire and bloodshed. Yep, yep. Well, Warrington, uh, you, uh, how I say, treated me to be included in the screening of a film that you work very closely on uh, with the team. Uh, it was the remaking of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, but set in the outskirts of Paris in France. And I remember you did a beautiful introduction. Most of the people were producers, actors, directors in the audience for that screening. About three quarters of the way through the film, a gentleman just jumped up and blurted out, why don't they make films this good in America? Mm -hmm. And everybody cheered. Yeah. (laughs) But Les Mis 
that that was a powerful, powerful film. And that was about the interface between law enforcement and the black population in France. But boy, did it, it resonate with the kind of, which I'll call contradictions that we're forced to embrace in our country. The movie, in, in retrospect, is prophetic. I mean, it, it came out in, in January of this year, at least in the United States. It was nominated for a Academy Award. It actually won, it won in, the, in, in France the César, which is the equivalent of the Oscar. And yep. it just, as, you, as I think you agree, it's brilliantly executed. And oh. so, so, so it's, it's, those movies can be made anywhere, but you got to have resources to finance those movies. Uh, you and I have talked about projects I would love to do in Detroit, which has similar kind of valence, but right. raising money for those kinds of movies are very, very difficult. So yes. uh, the thing is, the way America maintains uh, its, 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 um, its, its uh, let's call it its, its uh, racial and class ecology, the way they maintain that is by making sure who gets access to resources to make production. And so if you control that access, then you can make sure only certain kinds of stories that get told. But, but just because we don't get a chance to tell the stories does not mean we have no stories to tell. That's right. Now, I do remember in the, uh, in the aftermath of that screening, you had a reception, and I was talking to the gentleman who was the, one of the lead actors who joined us that night. Yes, yes. And he was describing to me how what was so authentic was that many of the, which you may call broad range of cast and younger people mm -hmm. were actually people, they were not hired actors after some kind of, you know, casting call or what have you. Yes. They were actually residents of the region. Yes. They, yes. So on film, they were living the truth of how they lived. And that was a very, I just, it just made me tingle to watch yeah. that film. Yeah. And I've seen it now three times. Oh, good, 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 good. good. And, uh, and man, and, oh, man. You know, it's playing now for any on, of on your listeners who have Amazon Prime. It's That's played, right. It's they currently play it so you can see for yourself. And, and, and I yep. think you guys who's listening will may agree, should probably agree that this is, a, for me, you know, and I'm, I'm, I have been organizing black filmmakers for over 40 years. This is the most amazing film I've seen in those 40 years. Yeah. I remember you said it at the time, and I don't think anybody walked out of the theater that night disagreeing with you. Mm -hmm. But there was there was something, and even even that lead actor, I can't remember his name right now, who I was talking with, mm -hmm. he felt overcome by the magic yeah. of what transpired yeah. in that film. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I mean, again, if 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 a filmmaker becomes a medium, becomes a bridge to bring uh, a, 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 a frame of reality. Because see, we, all of us, is, is, you know, we, we, live, we walk the streets, we see things, but, but a filmmaker can frame it in a way that's like, oh, so this is what's going on. Yeah. And so I think that the, our, our challenge as artists is to figure out how do I frame what you see every day in a way that makes you see it in a way that gives you insight and meaning. And that filmmaker's name is Lodge Lee, based in Paris. He did just that. He took the day-to-day -day reality of blacks and the Arabs and, and outside, of, outside of Paris, the suburbs, and framed it in a way that, oh, we now understand how it goes. And it wasn't one-dimensional. It was no good guys, bad guys. Everybody was complicated. And that's also why it had such power. You know, it's, uh, the human con condition is just really so, so complicated. And uh, it's no easy answers. That's right. And I'm going to build a bridge here, but the scene in that film that touched me mm -hmm. was when the black member of the police force went home to see his mother. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And talk about, Ooh. talk about the role of mama. That's right. You shared, you shared with me some graffiti today about George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And and what what was the saying on that graffiti that you showed me from Instagram? He says when he called for his mama, all mamas were called. Yes, yes. So at that at that point, at the pivot point, at the place in that film, and I don't want to give too much away. I want everybody to watch it. Mama played a role. 
Absolutely. Just as and, and, and Mama played, just as Mama played a role mm-hmm. in the movie we just saw over nine minutes. That's right. That's that drove right. us all crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. And and when you get it right, you get it right. I mean, I I know when I saw it, uh, I called up the the head of uh, Amazon. I said, "Listen, uh, I've been in business for a long time, and I don't know if you know what you got, but I know what you got." And I'm willing to volunteer my services free of charge to help you get the word out. And they were like surprised and pleased. They said, okay, fine. We'll, you know, we'll book the, book the room. We'll pay for it. And then I called you and I called all the people who are, who are interested in social justice, but that they work behind the camera or in front of the camera or, or in, in finance, music, et cetera. So it was an eclectic yeah. room, a multicultural eclectic room of like-minded people who I knew. Yeah, I sat with I sat with Rashad Robinson from yeah. Color Change at the That's film. That's right, and and I, I love sitting next to Rashad because he's very expressive. Oh yeah, <laughs> and it was oh, one moment in the film I thought he was going to jump up, you know, because it was just so powerful. That's right. He's got his heart on his sleeve for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> in a beautiful, beautiful way. It's it's not self indulgence; it's radiance. Precisely. And, yep. But. So let's let's talk a little bit about where a person like you, a filmmaker, in this case, we're talking in Les Mis, you're talking about you seeing something someone else did and running it up the flagpole with your relationships to make sure mm-hmm. it got the attention it deserved. Sure. But what 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 kind of things are you envisioning making now? What what's been on what's been in your pipeline for some time? You mentioned the project in Detroit that we discussed, but mm-hmm. what what are you what are you planning to say to the world through your own work in this next period? Well, I mean, it's pretty much. A, I mean, my 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 statement, my insight, the thing I'm going to share that hasn't been unchanged. I mean, I started to uh, make film in the '70s, and I I was in college in the '70s, and and the 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 milieu. I mean, when, when I was a freshman, uh, Bobby Seale was on trial two mm. blocks from, from where my dorm was. And the Black Panther Party was very strong in New Haven, Connecticut. And so I came to a consciousness at a time of tremendous uh, breaking of the frame of, of the American lie. And so with so many active speakers, super articulate, aggressive people who said, no, 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 we, this is not how it really works. So I had the benefit of having those voices. I mean, as a young person hearing those articulate voices saying, this is how America really works. So when I became a filmmaker, I said, okay, let me bring those artistic skills to advance those points of view in in a way that's dramatic and engaging. So that hasn't changed. But what has changed is that the some some technology has changed. Most recently, and this I mean, I say I mean like a day ago. I realized that the the social distancing means even if I get money right now to do my other projects, I couldn't do them because it's not safe. There's 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 no treatment, there's no vaccine. It's we in a very right. we in a shutdown period. So I've been doing investigation because I once before I did a project on what's called VR, which is virtual reality. And that you can do with, with social distancing and, and computer animation and, and a whole bunch of new technology. So I've turned my attention to that space on an interim basis. And when you uh, talk about how technology has changed, mm-hmm. it's not everybody going to the theater anymore. In fact, I tell you, it's, it's uh, yeah, well, one sobering note is AMC Theater, which is one of the largest theater chains in America, is uh is in is is doing bankruptcy bankruptcy protection. I saw that. Yeah, they were a big uplift to the theatrical release of Amazing Grace that I yes, worked on. Yes, yes, yeah. Which, by the uh, way, let me let me let me one more one more time. Thank you for rescuing that movie because that movie is so unbelievably powerful. And, yeah. and if you had not intervened and 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 got the resources and the and, and into release. That we have never, never, we have may have never seen that magic because there's nothing. The only way to describe that amazing grace is about magic, and and from scene to scene to scene, moment to moment, it's just like it's just incredible, just incredible. It, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you watch Aretha for ninety minutes, and she she doesn't she doesn't say three words, mm -hmm. but she's in total command, and everybody understands. Yes, yes, yes. And as yes. I I watched her as I was getting ready for the negotiations with her and her family while mm -hmm. she was still alive, I I went up to uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, one night. Mm -hmm. I think it was March twelfth of twenty seventeen. Mm -hmm. People had told me her cancer had gone into remission. She was enthusiastic. And mm -hmm. my friend Alan Light, who I think you know, that writes for the New York Times and mm -hmm. Rolling Stone, mm -hmm. was sitting next to me. And he says, I've seen her many, many times. I wasn't prepared for this. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him and I said, is she a person or an angel? Wow. I just can't. I can't not feel she was an angel. And wow. that experience in 1972. Mm -hmm. In that church in Los Angeles with James Cleveland and the choir and the oh, congregation oh, yeah. and that wonderful band, yes, she she was like an angel. For sure, she just so went beyond and beyond and beyond. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody who doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to give them that movie and then right. and then we'll talk about it. That's we'll, right. That's we'll right. talk about it. That's proof positive. Proof positive. And in the theater, in the theater in Queens, uh, we showed it. What was it? Uh, back oh, in that's the fall. Right. I mean, people were like just touched. You, I mean, it's yeah. just undeniable, yeah. you know. Now, so you don't have to believe; just be able to feel. That's it. That's it. And I think the uh, how I say the gifts, the craftsmanship, the hard work, the rehearsals, and the insight mm -hmm. that Aretha had to go back to her roots yes. after she's already a star in soul and crossover and making right. big money for Atlantic. Right. And go, but to go into that place mm -hmm. and just flow like she did. Oh, there oh, was, oh, oh, she, as, oh, as the preacher said, she really never left. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So music today, mm -hmm. what are you listening to? What, what's coming out what do you what do you go to your music you know your playlists or your LPs or what what are you pulling out? I know uh, Wesley Morse, who I knew from the Aretha Project, the New York Times, just brought forward uh, the old Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes song sung by Patti LaBelle. Mm -hmm. If you don't know me by now, never never know me. That's right. And, and I mean, everybody's I, crying that listens yeah, to that song right that's now. That's right. That's right. I mean, I, I'm I'm. I'm I'm in a bind now because I'm trying to stay open to new sounds, but the, the the music of my generation is so unbelievably rich that I use I go I I can almost retreat into the sounds of of the sixties and seventies and eighties because it's medicinal, and and you can listen whatever's going on in your life. There's a song where some artist has 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 composed and performed, and 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 it gives you that exorcism. And and so music for me is is uh is 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 that kind of medicinal therapeutic experience, and yeah. um, it, there's literally is nothing, whether it be whether it be uh, uh, a, a a ballad or something up tempo, I mean, you know, music is healing. Period. No other way to describe it. That's right. I've been listening to a song and I I had no idea way why. Mm -hmm. As after the lockdown started, mm -hmm. and and I was not historically a big fan of the band U two, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but one of their early songs is called Forty okay. after Psalm Forty from the Bible, mm -hmm. and the second verse says, "He set my feet upon a rock and made my footsteps firm. Mm -hmm. Many will see, many will see and hear. Mm -hmm. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song." How long to sing this song? Mm -hmm. And I think I, that's where I'm feeling with the shattering of the defense of conventional wisdom, yeah. with the yeah. amount of distress that's been revealed, with the chaos and the yearning yeah. for order. Mm -hmm. What's the new song? We got to sing a new song. Yeah, yeah. And some clue for the new song would rely on some of the old songs. I mean, when faced with this kind of tremendous adversity, I often think about Jimmy Cliff singing "Too Many Rivers Across." I mean, it's 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 you know, I mean, only my faith will carry me on. You know, it's it's um yeah yeah. Well, I've been listening to John Coltrane's "Alabama," mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I've been listening to uh, Bob Marley, Stand Up, Get Up. Oh, yeah. Redemption song. That's right. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Sure. Only you can free your mind. Mm-hmm. Exodus. Uh, yeah. All of these in, things, in, in ways, all of these things resonate with where we are. You know, again. in many ways, I, it, it's the, the musicians and the singers as as the featured artists have been so far ahead of the other people, the other art forms. I mean, with notable exception. I mean, maybe August Wilson as a as a playwright is, a, is in their league and 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 a couple other filmmakers, but but overall, I mean the, the musicians are just they're just at the point. You know, they're like they get it and they and they, and they sing it and perform in a way that oh yeah, everybody connects with it. Yeah. Well, at some level, which you might call they're tapped into the electricity of emotion. Yeah. Yes. And at some level they're they're the best, both poets and, and artists are, are prescient. Mm-hmm. They can they can feel it before we can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I think yes, yes. But in addition to that, if we, I mean, my obviously my art from his film, if I could truly understand how and why they do this, how and what they do, then I can translate that into cinema. And and many the, the I mean many ways if you if you listen closer to the musicians. It gives you all the clues you need for for you as a, as 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 a, as a filmmaker. So I try to, in fact, mm-hmm. when I write my screenplays, I always have some music on in the background, mm-hmm. and, and, and gives you my 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 cues and my clues. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like a catalytic exactly. elixir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or as you said earlier, it's the Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, it's a very interesting. Uh, I have a friend who's a poet, I think you and I have discussed, Ed Pavlik, who uh, wrote a book about the inspiration of James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And Baldwin was this fascinating man who I guess I would have described early in his early years as almost like a jujitsu stiletto essay fighter. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was, he was as lucid and, sharp he could win any debate yeah he was brilliant but he had a epiphany mm-hmm. listening to a song by aretha franklin Whoa. from the album aretha arrives called i wonder mm-hmm. and in that he basically came out and he said she in that song speaks to the people and the person at the same time. Wow. Meaning he was speaking to the crowd about the context, Mm -hmm. but he wasn't reaching the heart. Yeah, yeah. So he went to his friend, whose name was Ray Charles, Mm -hmm. and they composed something together called the Hallelujah Chorus that was Mm -hmm. premiered at the opening night of the Newport Jazz Festival, which used to be at Carnegie Hall in New York before they Mm -hmm. went out to Newport, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And they did something together which is they had the same story. And Baldwin did it as spoken word essay. And Ray Charles did it elliptically and poetically through music and lyrics and symbolism and sound. Wow. And the critics hated Baldwin and they loved Ray Charles. And they both knew they had exactly the same message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that transformation into the poetic style Mm -hmm was a big part of Baldwin. Now, there, there's some work that Pavlik has done subsequently mm-hmm. where he followed some correspondence over over 30 years between Baldwin and his brother, uh, whose name was David. Mm-hmm. I think James was the oldest, and this was the, the next mm-hmm. oldest sibling. And he used to describe that there were many James Baldwins, the first of which was James Baldwin, the essayist we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. The second was Jimmy Baldwin, the black gay man who had a, we might say, an undercover social life. Mm-hmm. Uh, the third was what he called Jamie Baldwin, which was this beautiful member of a family who wanted to make everybody proud through whatever he did. 
Mm-hmm. But the fourth one was, I don't remember the phrase, but it was something like the unnamed persona that goes into seclusion mm-hmm. and asks to receive inspiration. Wow. And that the other three nourishments from family, mm-hmm. from social and love life, and from community engagement and purpose have to be lifting his spirit to where he can be receptive mm-hmm. to those signals. Exactly. And I, I, it's the most beautiful characterization of the creative process I've ever been exposed to. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. but it sounded to you, I, I wasn't even thinking about that when, when you and I got on the, uh, on the call here, yeah. but you, you brought it out of me a recollection from yours before in the way you described your process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, something, um, uh, another uh, point of entry was, uh, they, they would think August Wilson was quoted and how he'll sit at, at the desk and, and, and the a character would walk in the room and start talking to him. And so he, it, it, the character is his guide, his narrator. And I really believe that, 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 that that level of art, when when you move beyond artifice, when you really are channeling the story that must be told, there's other forces that guide you. And mm-hmm. the same way that if it's 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 the same way there's in a Pentecostal church this moment of religious ecstasy, or or in a in a Brazilian candomblé, or I mean, there are moments in which you are in touch with with the unseen forces that that tell you. Why you here and what you need to do? Yeah, and the artists who can listen will be very, very uh, create powerful work. When you talk about channeling, it always takes me back to watching Audra McDonald when she played Billie Holiday mm-hmm. in that wonderful play about uh, at the Emerson Grill, Lady Day at the Emerson Bar and Grill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just I watched her and I felt like. She was just showing me Billy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was no actress. She was a conduit. Yeah, and exactly. uh, it exactly. was a brilliant, brilliant performance. Mm-hmm. So the, uh, the politics of right now, this is, this is what you might call, I mean, you, you said it very well in the beginning of our conversation. You, you said that in essence, this has been here. Yeah, and, and the difference is that that people will look in the mirror and don't like what they see. But but what's been going on is like when you is, is like when if you've been overeating for the last few to whatever years, and like, who how how did that happen? No, you've been doing it. You just haven't seen yourself. You haven't had that reflection. So in fact, uh, uh, you showed me that extraordinary T-shirt, and 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 in relief was all these incredible faces. But it was like it was dozens and dozens of faces. So clearly, I mean, uh, 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 brother brother George Floyd is the latest and and gruesomeness example. But these things, unfortunately, have been consistent. Yeah, I mean, what we can hope is that he's the straw that broke the camel's back. And yeah. leads to yeah. uh, leads yeah. to okay. change, but 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 you gotta be you, you gotta be skeptical. You can, but you can hope. But, but that. just just that we have to start with. I think that the, here's the thing: as long as we think that something's wrong, then that's what we 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 we're disadvantaged. We got to say why does this happen? Let's address why. If we treat this as something unusual, or this 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 misconduct is there for a reason. The police departments historically grew out of, out of slave patrols and slave catchers. The relation of police and black people was always as an as a oppressive, abusive, occupying force. So, so of course they act like this. It makes sense. And, and so, yeah. and so in, until, we, until we acknowledge why this is happening, we'll be at disadvantage to trying to fix it. Yeah. And, and also, it's going to be a problem because when you begin to figure out if the solution requires a loss of white privilege, then, then it's going to be a real test. 
you know. I mean, the woman in Central Park, she said, how dare this guy speak to her about her dog off the leash? And she was genuinely, oh, yeah. she was yeah, genuinely yeah. offended that he didn't know his place. And he was, and he spoke to her and he was, you can see on the tape, he was very calm, you know, but she was, I mean, I'm just recognizing that, that she, I'm sure, thought she was being reasonable. So there's, there's, there's a set of, of circumstances and a mindset where she feels comfortable with doing that. And so therefore she made that phone call and pushed those buttons to, 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 to have the police come and put him to his, in his place or, or else, you know, take his life. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea that a person, however uncomfortable or scared or whatever, could resort to that tool tells you about and, and, that social system that we are. Yes. And you use the word resort. I wouldn't even say resort. She went there quickly. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. he it was like he was approaching her. He was telling her, please don't approach me. This right. is something. She was, she was, she felt his 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 speaking to her that way was an was a, was an encroachment on her privilege, and she was putting him. In, it's not unlike um, I mean, you go back to the the, the Emmett Till thing. I mean, the woman lied about right. him whistling at her. It's yep. always it's, it's that it's that white America at their fingertips has a trigger to always put this take take the black people out. And they use it when they're having a bad day, they'll just, get, just kill him. And so who yep. knows what she may have been having a bad day about something. It's nothing to do with that man. But him no. speaking to her, exerting his rights was offensive to her. And that's that's the overall issue. I mean, if you look at the police situations, it's they always talking about cooperate, obey. I mean, the, the violence I see in all my all these Instagram feeds I collect is always police saying, you need to Kneel down, put your hands up, do this. And if you don't immediately commit, then all kind of bodily harm can flow to you. And there's a there's a, there's a, a, a entitlement, a white racist in, entitlement to make black bodies and brown bodies and yellow bodies submit. And when they don't, they do harm to them. So it's come down to something very simple and psychological like that. If you don't submit, you have consequences. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, but I guess what I was trying to say was that woman couldn't have invoked that unless she believed that it was available. Absolutely, and she was, and right. that's, and and you yeah, know, yeah, and, that that's right. She she and, codified, and, she and, validated what you said, and and fortunately, he was smart enough to to leave leave the scene because when mm-hmm. police came, he wasn't there anymore. Right. I mean, because he could have misplayed his hand too. He was very calm. He recorded everything. He spoke in a modulated tone. I mean, he could have been as angry as her, and he may be dead right now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's here. It's been here. Yeah. But I'm thinking of Jimi Hendrix via Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. There must be some kind of way out of here," said the Joker to the thief. Mm-hmm. "There's too much confusion. I can't get no relief. Yeah, right. Businessmen, they drink my wine, plow and dig my earth. Mm-hmm. None were level on the mind. Mm-hmm. Nobody up at his word. How are we going to change? How are we going to change and, the, and- the contours? Mm-hmm. And, and how are we going to break out of this system that you're right has had?" And and we dehumanizing have, effects on everybody, whether they acknowledge it or not. That's born right. by the black people, but you are not a human if you're if you're right. if you're abiding by that system as though it were legitimate. That's There's right. There's something ugly about you. So 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 the only thing I would I would insert into that is that how we do it has to be preceded about why this thing exists. If we don't first start why this 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 is this is not a this is not something that doesn't come out. It didn't come. We there's a reason why America operates the way it does. And until we first start with that, I don't think I'm not optimistic about progress. Yeah. Well, I'm a doctor's son, so diagnosis has to has That's right. to uh, there you go. precede remedy and, and prescription. There you go. There you go. 
And if you don't diagnose properly, you're not fighting the disease. Precisely right. Yeah. And again, I mean, uh, the system, uh, the system is, is the system doesn't fail people who, who the system was not built to protect. In in your reading, in your thinking about the history of, we've talked about music, but mm -hmm. the people, the Malcolm X, mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Old Negro spirituals. Where, mm -hmm. where do you find inspiration? Well, um, when I was sixteen, uh, Fred Hampton had a, mm. leader of the Black Panther Party in Chicago, yep. and I was in East St. Louis, Illinois, which is you know downstate from Chicago, and I was just impressed by this guy. He was just this young, charismatic guy, and I told my parents I want to go to Chicago and join the Black Panther Party. And my father said, you're 16 years old, you're under my roof, and you're not going anyway. And I kicked and screamed and hollered, you know, and, and but, I, you know, he's he's the boss, so I didn't go. And the next morning, he walked in my room and threw the paper. The new headline was, Fred Hampton was murdered. Oof. He said, now, see, I told you. And, and he was right about the danger, but I was right that this young man, you know, in his 20s in Chicago was so potent that the police felt the need to assassinate him. Mm -hmm. And so I have been, always been struck by the presence of, of, of men and women who have such heroic power, who have such tremendous charisma, who are such great articulators that they can stand up, fight back, and inspire others. So, and some of them are, are, are straight up organizers like Fran Hampton. Others are artists like Catherine Dunham. Uh, Harry Belafonte. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, in my life, I've sought out these people, and I've been blessed because some of them accepted me as their mentor, as their mentees. Uh, specifically, Catherine Dunham and Belafonte has, has been my been my mentor, and 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 Melvin Van Peebles has guided me. And so, I just simply try to um, be a good student and apply the apply the lessons. Well, you've had some. Beautiful teachers, Harry Belafonte. I just watched that film that Susan Rostock made, Sing oh, Your Song. Extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary film. Yeah, and uh, she was talking to me a couple of years ago about wanting to make another film about his work in the prisons. Mm -hmm. and, and through his guidance, my, my wife Alexis knows mm -hmm. Harry uh, Belafonte and his daughter and sure. a couple of their staff. Sure. And he, he and uh, some people at the Open Society Foundation got me set up to go visit Sing Sing for yeah. a day or two. And uh, boy, well, that was a profound experience. Well, what, what, what I would say my best friend in life, unfortunately he's no longer with us, he was, uh, works for foster care. And he and he would often you know, deal with, because uh, foster kids going in, unfortunately, often cycle in and out of prisons. So mm -hmm. I, he's my friend, because we met in, in, in the martial arts school. And we were like, you know, they call it dojo brothers, you know, people who train martial yeah. arts together. And he would go speak in the juvenile home, juvenile detention, and he said he told me the story. He would come in and and to, to talk, the guards would bring him into the room, and everybody would like not pay attention, be loud and just disrespectful. And so he saw he couldn't get any attention. So he told the guard, "said Listen, you 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 guys can leave." And he said, "What?" He said, "No no no, go, go ahead and leave, go ahead and leave." And the and the inmates, these again, these are juveniles, not adults. They like, damn. The guards left, left in, in him by, by yourself. He said, yeah, I did because you guys are obviously not paying any attention to me because you think I'm a punk and I can't fight. Well, they're not here now. It's me and you. So, so, let me, so let's, let's, let's have a conversation. Before we talk, if anybody here thinks they can beat me, let's do that right now. <laughs> and nobody yeah. moves. Cause they, they, is they it, and is so, this the gentleman I met that night before the Aretha screening? No, he passed. He passed some years ago. Oh, he, oh okay. But he you, had, you had another martial arts friend that was there that night. Oh right? yeah, 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 yeah. I my, that's the two. I world. I walk in two worlds, man. I walk in the, in the in the the activist world, and I walk in the martial art world. And those sometimes they overlap. But this guy, man, um, and and then everybody's everybody pay attention. Oh, okay. So, so with, 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 there are certain states of mind to reach a young person who's in that state of violence. 
then you have to say, okay, no, you, you, because everybody's afraid of them. And once you say, oh, I'm not afraid of you, and then they, then they, they would, then they would give you their attention. And Belafonte has a similar, not Belafonte's going to fight anybody, but Belafonte's fearless. He's faced all kinds of threat and violence. So having done that, he's able to command attention. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's a regalness. There's an aura about him. Oh, yeah. Even when I've been to fundraisers where he's speaking or one night, uh, he and Cornell West and mm -hmm. myself and uh, some people were affiliated with the union theological seminary. And mm -hmm. as everybody was talking this and that, and then when he started to speak, yeah, you could hear a pin drop. The sure. focus was sure. complete. No, he's, 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 um, this, he's uh he doesn't have any, any he isn't he's in a, he's peerless he does, he's peerless yeah yeah well, my detroit uh franklin family uh connection tells me that uh he used to team with aretha and hold conference concerts together to support martin luther king i did not know that wow that they they actually bailed on him what it, bailed him out of what would have been a bankruptcy one or two times. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Aretha also provided the money to Angela Davis when she needed to get bailed to get out of prison before mm -hmm. her trial. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but, but Harry Belafonte has been there from, from the beginning Absolutely. of, of his life. And, uh, and, and, and at, 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 at tremendous expense and risk and jeopardy, yes. you know, yeah. um, I, I had the privilege he invited me to um to a party at his house, and I I may have been the youngest. No, it was oh me and Walter Mosley were probably the youngest guys in the room. Wow, and we were not wow. young, but everybody else everybody else was in their in their seventies and eighties, and and the Catherine Dunham was there and she was in her nineties, and I sat next to Ossie Davis and Ruby D, and and Bella Fonte, they were telling stories about the Freedom Rides, and these were harrowing, terrifying stories. But in the blues tradition, they were funny. And they told the story about how uh, 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 Ossie Davis, who's from the South, knew about the South, and knew how to navigate the South, was his, 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 his colleagues was, was Belafonte and Poitier, who were both you know, Caribbean guys who didn't know the South. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one day, they overslept. And they woke up, and the bus had pulled away. So you had these two guys who are New York Caribbean guys panicking because the buses left them. And Austin Davis thought that was the funniest thing ever. And they were just cracking up. No <laughs> one, it's like laughing at the terror of that moment. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the great theologian, the late James Cone, mm -hmm. wrote a book called The Spirituals and the Blues. Oh, yeah. And he said the spirituals are a time when you know you're in chains and you're singing about the afterlife. He said, but the blues, which really are in the Jim Crow era, mm -hmm. are people who are allegedly free who are not free. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you use code and humor to create defiance in the here and now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, laugh, you laugh at your fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. speak in code in defiance. I mean, I made I made a record with a gentleman named Willie King, who was a fantastic blues artist, and uh, he had a song called "The Boss Man and the Baby," and he told me that what he was really singing about was that when you're in those days in the juke joint, and the boss man comes in with his security people to watch, mm -hmm. you sing about my baby's hurting me, my baby's hurting me, and the boss man. Maybe he had, you know, some pain in his marital relationship or whatever. Mm. And he'd be starting to nod. But everybody in the room knew you were talking about the boss man sure. in code. You weren't talking about the baby. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that, so that, that defiance in those dangerous circumstances sometimes involves a lot of humor and a lot of laughter. But it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's deadly serious. I agree. But, but I would also, those things, I also give – Blues, another a kind of a, a elevated status, where it, it becomes philosophical and spiritual, and it's but it but it's it's not um it's it it's spiritual as it's almost like an existential statement, and that why and the difference for me between gospel and blues 
is that in, in the gospel, there is there's this salvation. There's, you know, Jesus is going to intervene. Jesus is going to redeem you. Jesus is going to save you. And the blues, you just sit there. You know, it's just, it, it is what it is. And it's, and it's no way out. And you're trapped and you're caught. But you, but there's no need to fall apart. You go ahead and turn it into art. And for me, uh, blues is an existentialist, existentialist expression. And for me, that's even more powerful because there is no resolution. There's no escape. There's no redemption. It's just you as a human being staring into the abyss. That's right. You're talking to a guy named Robert Johnson, so I can't disagree with you. That's Robert. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the uh, you mentioned earlier Freddie Hampton. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a conversation on this podcast a couple of weeks ago with Isaiah Thomas, the mm -hmm. NBA star legend from, from the Detroit Pistons, who grew up in Chicago, and his mother, Mary. Mm -hmm. He's got a, a charity in her honor called Mary's Court. She was an activist, but she worked in Chicago with Freddie Hampton. Yeah, yeah. And he described that in our in our session. I hope people will step back and, and how do you say, retouch with, with Isaiah's beautiful, beautiful representation of, of his approach to life. And uh, I, I think I, I named that session Strength Through Vulnerability. Mm -hmm. that he's he's got a really quiet warmth about him but mm -hmm. freddie hampton was a a big symbol a big uh but, but a, beacon, it, a beacon in his life and and think about what he did i mean chicago like like many cities at that time was gang ridden so you had the blackstone rangers you had this group and that group yeah. and they were all basically pathological destroying each other and so he from my understood he called a meeting and everybody came to all the different gangs came to the big meeting. He was all in the same room, all feeling hostile. And uh, Fred had his, had his Panthers like, okay, they, they locked the doors. It's okay. And we're not, nobody's leaving until we, until we, we reach a peace, a peace agreement. And they were shocked. But the Panthers were all armed. So like, oh, you in the room now and they got guns and we don't. And, but basically he wasn't trying to, he wasn't using threat to intimidate. He was trying to use threats to get your attention to focus, to hear what he has to say. And he was mm -hmm. traditionally insightful and charismatic. So the guy said, yeah, yeah, you're making sense. You're making sense. So he brought peace to a, war, a, a community that was at war with itself. And that's mm -hmm. why the police had to assassinate him, because that's what they fear more yeah. than anything else. Yeah, they couldn't divide and conquer as easily with his cohesive presence. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, ma'am. So you're seeing uh, a whole lot of turmoil. It's not surprising. Yep. What does surprise you right now? I'm surprised that that the echo of this has reached the other side of the world. When I say New Zealand respond, and that's literally the other side of the world. And I saw this morning the, there was a, uh, a statue in, 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 uh, in the U.K., of a slave uh, trader, and they put a rope around it and put it off the pedestal and dropped it into the river. I mean, mm. the, the the international echoes. I must say that does surprise me. I do, I, I do uh, experience a tension in the contrast. Mm -hmm. While we have activism here, and we're talking about you know another surprise restructuring, dismantling and restructuring the Minnesota Police Department. That, These yeah. are actions that are are yeah. almost unprecedented For as sure. a reaction. For sure. But but what I'm seeing, those structural things mm -hmm. here, I had a call with a friend this morning who said, why are people honoring these people like heroes all over the world, mm -hmm. but not here? We yeah. need a memorial service for all the pictures, yeah. in that he, all the people in that hero's picture. Yes, plus yes, yes. George mm -hmm. Floyd. Yeah, where where is the memorial for the unnecessary brutal loss? Is is the question? But it's beautiful to see it elsewhere. Even so, it is sure. a pleasant but, surprise. But 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 the most beautiful thing for me is the the fact that City Council of Minneapolis voted to to uh, uh, replace. 
the police department with, with public safety office. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a, a, a congressman, or, or, um, I'm sorry to his, pronounce his name. He's in uh, California, um, uh, South K, South Asian brother. Anyway, he, um, he is introduced la language to to um, there's situ some kind of immunity clause in most police contracts um, that allow them to really not be held accountable. I mean, if we can simply get the police contracts renegotiated or never sign again with that kind of language that allows them to 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 be abusive and get away with it, then you'll see changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I knew that I could kill you and and the odds that I can walk away with it, then I wouldn't hesitate to kill. I mean. People need consequences, and the police unions protect the police officers from consequences. And it, and it's really, it helps the individual bad people, but it hurts everybody because now genuine people who, who are, are responsible are looked at askance because they were, they were, they were basically a, a organized crime ring. Well, at some level, I think we all agree that law enforcement is a necessary part of a social structure. Sure. But the nature of how law enforcement is conducted is a human institution, and it can take a lot of different forms between, which you might call representing the public good on the positive side of the pendulum, mm -hmm. and this vigilante hideousness that's, how I say, been quite present particularly in black communities. And, and it's different between law, on the other. law and justice. Those are two things that yeah. only occasionally overlap. Mm -hmm. But you're right. When you talk about what, you know, what, what are the green shoots? What's blossoming? That, that decision in Minnesota sets a precedent. Yeah. It makes it reasonable for other communities to consider similar. Yeah, exactly. Cause no one wants changes. to be but everybody's allowed to be second. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think this is important because after watching uh, the president of the United States discussion or not watching, listening mm -hmm. to the leaked tapes of the president's discussion with 50 governors. Yes. The idea that you got to go crack some heads, et cetera, and that's going to mobilize popularity. Mm -hmm. We I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat. I worked in both parties in the U.S. Senate in my earlier years. You just can't talk as though being monstrous is okay exactly. in any circumstance. Exactly. Yep. And uh, how would I say the better angels emerged in Minneapolis on that day that you described. Mm -hmm. And and hopefully we get the follow through and hopefully we, we see that as starting a, a precedent and a momentum. I, I have friends who actually have spent time in law enforcement in the UK. Mm -hmm. And they tell me they'd be terrified to be a police officer in the United States. Wow. Partly because the culture is so weaponized. Yes, yes, yes. And partly because they don't want to use a gun on somebody and then have to live with themselves the rest of their life. And also, I mean, as you know, I've, I've practiced martial arts all my life. And the, 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 the fact that they reach for the gun so quickly they had any kind of serious martial art training, you don't need to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, it, I, I just don't understand why you can't uh, control a situation without lethal, without lethal violence. Yeah. Well, Warrington, it's always fascinating, illuminating. You're, you're like the Reggie Jackson of my podcast, the straw that stirs the drink. Well, I, listen, I'm happy to be. I'm happy to contribute because what you've been doing all your life, and and particularly in 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 art, politics, economics, and music and science. I mean, I have much respect, so I thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Well, all I'm going to say is thank you, and let's wait. Uh, watch how the world evolves. Keep working together on projects related to film and the like. Yes. Talk more about the Detroit possibilities. Absolutely. Which you know has my heart. That's right. And and then uh, let's come back and do another podcast after we've seen the world turn a few times. I am standing by and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you again.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.